according to Darwin, the, the earliest forms of language came when, when grunts or groans or very, very crude, but nevertheless slightly specific utterances were assigned to certain of life's crises, like say fire or danger or some enormous dinosaur would come and there'd be a special grunt that everyone knew, but it wasn't really a word per se. Perhaps one syllable or one phoneme had been affixed to a grunt, perhaps say for, for purposes of argument uh, that a D, like our word for dinosaur, was attached to a growl, like a duh, duh, meant dinosaur, and eventually languages formed out of little words. And um, But prior to that point, of course, man did communicate with his own kind, and it was through these preverbal grunts. And there is a kind of music in that, and of course, Cage's definition of music, which is prob certainly the most contemporary definition of music, says simply all sound is music. <laughs> I could possibly imagine that people sat around campfires in some uh, primeval setting and made music, made, had rhythmic chants or had something going on out of their grunts before they had a word to describe it. What my group and my work has been about is to try to leave the, the rigors of the technique of singing in tune behind so that something else could flow out, something more perhaps simplistic, but something more primitive and emotional. So we use cackles and moans and sighs and groans and textures and rhythmic chants and... That's just what that piece should be. We don't have to rehearse it anymore. The ending might be more, <laughs> might be more elaborate than that. Cause, yeah. Here again, we're going for an abstraction rather than an imitation of the birds. You may want to have them imitate the bird for a moment as an exercise to feel closer with the bird. But after that, we abstract. And um, John creates a, a, a link in some way to an abstract sound that's very bird-like. So this is great. We're going to slip through. Darwin speculated that animals, that certain species especially, are quite musical and that on certain occasions dogs and wolves and others seem to make barking sounds and howling sounds for no apparent reason. That is, that normally there are territorial reasons or mating reasons or various signalings. And on other occasions they seem to be doing it for the sheer fun and enjoyment of making the sounds. Part of what I wanted to do when I was approached by the zoo to, to become involved up there was to write a score that was for the zoo walked around from one animal group to, the, to another, interviewed some of the keepers. I was trying to detect any trends that I could in terms of how the, the animals reacted to sound or reacted with sound. I wrote a piece for the sea lions, which we call a sea lion's wisdom, rather serious, almost Gregorian chant-like chorale that depicts a, a kind of ancient wisdom for the sea lions. And it's written in four-part harmony, and then in the middle of it, we begin to bark.
one of the main themes of all the workshop in the entire day is that we are learning sounds of a particular animal and taking them around and traveling them past other animals. It's a very important image for the whole day. It never ends, including the, the, uh, the myth part. So that it's not just that we're learning this one little sort of token gratuitous sound and then we go and do a show with it. It's that we're sharing sounds constantly with the other creatures and trying to get them to do things back to us or not even trying to get them to, but to allow them to. Right behind the snakes is a collection of camels. Right behind the camels is a, connect, is a collection of, of news. Now where we're heading at the moment is to the sea lines where we're going to begin the sound trail. Natural Sound Ensemble accompanied by Mr. William Schimmel on the accordion and we are now beginning our sound trail. We're actually a bit behind schedule but we're beginning now and we invite those of you who are interested to follow us around from this location to various others. We'll be going to the bisons next and singing various pieces of music hoping that the animals will join us. and have never made any sounds and according to the keepers they're not particularly vociferous animals but um, nevertheless they may walk closer to us and that certainly is a response of some sort <laughs> <laughs> Wolves seem to me at the moment to be the most musical and the most responsive to sound. I, I sense, I deeply sense that there's some kinship between man and animals in general, and particularly between human song and the cry of wolves. Sing to that wolf. I'll give you three, four. Three, four. <laughs>
howling very gently to them, very gently and non-threatening, just a few howls all together. <laughs> Well, there's this great yellow and black Siberian tiger that's in a cage. And this tiger, every now and then, lets out the most mournful wail. It's a growl, it's a low howl of some sort. So we will certainly go to that cage and howl back with him or sing, sing a low, sustained, ohm-like chant. The whole premise of this comes from our, our proposal, if you will, that animals are, quote, musical in some way and will respond to humans making sound. And though we didn't do it in a truly scientific or methodical way, we felt that, that, that something perhaps inexplicable and, and verbally hard to pin down was communicated between man and animal through sound, non-verbally, this afternoon in our soundtrack.